My name is Laura DeLuca. I'm an anthropologist. I'm super passionate about anthropology and I'm really excited to share 10 things that you need to know about anthropology. Number one, anthropology has four fields. It's a four field discipline. We are going to be talking about cultural anthropology, but just for you to have the background, there is also first archeology, span which studies material remains. There's also physical anthropology, which includes primatology and paleontology the study of ancient humans and the study of primates. And then third is linguistic anthropology, looking at the technical aspects of language and what they can teach us about culture. What is cultural anthropology? Cultural anthropologists, I'm a cultural anthropologist, we deal with current living populations. And so it's super exciting to get to know those populations through field immersion, field work, really deeply immersing ourselves in their cultural context. Number two, field work is absolutely key to anthropology. I'm gonna show you, you know, there are tons of books that have been written about the importance of field work, field notes, the making of anthropology. Field work is our primary method. And what it normally means is at least 12 to 18 months of complete immersion in a culture. Now, stereotypically, when we think of anthropology, we think of Margaret Mead and Samoa or Gregory Bateson, far away so-called exotic cultures. Anthropology has moved more into urban anthropology, urban populations, sometimes even studying a business setting. So there's a lot of diversity within that field work, that current field work. Anthropology is does often involve travel, but it isn't just kind of freelance traveling. One of the things that really distinguishes anthropology is the field notes. And I'm going to show you this book, Field Notes, The Making of Anthropology by Roger Sanjek. It's been a huge topic within anthropology. Early anthropologists would tell their students, take a pencil and take notes. And now we've gotten a lot more detailed as a field to what kinds of notes you should be taking, immersing yourself, learning the language, eating the food, spending time, so much time with people that you become naturalistically part of the scene and people share observations with you as if you were part of that community. Field notes are what makes anthropology unique. Field notes are really important. So you're not just a traveler, you're doing field work and then religiously each night it takes a lot of discipline. You should be writing up your field notes, whether it's in a handwritten journal. This is a description, field notes, by Luis Antonio Vivanco at the University of Vermont about how to really practice and learn to take professional field notes. It's a really important skill set for anthropology. Anthropology does have colonial roots. At times, it's been called the handmaiden of colonialism. That is even gendered handmaiden of colonialism, because colonial officers would hire anthropologists to understand a group like the New Era people in Sudan, understand that they were acephalous or didn't have what we would call in the West an official leader. It was a headless, stateless society, but they had their own form of leadership. So that piece of anthropology being the handmaiden of colonialism, wearing the khaki hat, still is part of the discipline and something that the discipline struggles with in terms of power relations. But we've gotten more and more conscious of that. Also, the field has really diversified. So it's not only Evans Pritchard studying the newer um, white British male, but also people from the society themselves. And right now at this historical moment, there's so much attention to identity and identity politics. and my very first anthropology professor called himself one of the first brown anthropologists. His name is Gananath Obesekere, and he wrote about his own society. He's Sri Lankan, and he studied Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese communities, also looked at Tamil communities. So really interesting shift within anthropology. We called it the turn in anthropology. George Marcus, several others leading that intellectual turn in anthropology in the 1990s. 
So number five, anthropology is really similar to, but different from sociology and history. So people often ask, what's the difference between sociology and anthropology? Again, it's back to the field work, but also historically anthropologists studied formerly colonized societies. Now that boundary has been more blurred, but sociology tends to use more surveys, statistics, perhaps like quantitative information, whereas anthropology's real strength lies in the qualitative, in the interview, in the deep personal connection through field immersion. So that's really the difference. And then history, many more programs are starting to bring history in because we can't just look at one snapshot in time. We need to look at changes because societies are constantly changing and evolving. We can't force them into one traditional um, mold. And so history and power. The University of Michigan is a really strong program. Hopkins, University Johns Hopkins, when it comes to history and anthropology. Number six is that anthropology is really diversifying. Um, Jomo Kenyatta, the first independence leader in Kenya, was trained as an anthropologist, and he made an argument facing Mount Kenya about how we needed to look at indigenous Kikuyu methods of education as culturally important. Also, Zora Neale Hurston, the author, is trained as an anthropologist. And one of my favorite anthropology quotes, she talks about research just being formalized curiosity. And as the field gets more diverse, it's able to gain greater insights into a wider range of human understanding. Number seven, perspective is really important in anthropology and that has to do with identity. Two of the key terms when it comes to perspective are emic and edic, the insider and the outsider. But many of us can become insider outsiders in, in, in our society so it's not too distinct either you're an outsider or an insider but how that affects your understanding. One thing that we also do as anthropologists is traditionally we talk about cultural relativism. This is a term that's gotten a lot of criticism. Obviously, we don't take something like cultural relativism and apply it to the Holocaust. There's no way of suspending judgment when there's a human right violation. However, cultural relativism can be a useful tool just initially when you're first doing field work and you encounter something extremely different or maybe even disturbing to you personally. For example, when I was working in East Africa, polygamy, men having multiple wives, or female circumcision are both common practices. And before I, as a white Western woman, made a judgment on that, I tried to understand what is the meaning in that society. It doesn't mean that I ultimately accept or agree with it, but I want to understand on their own terms, not on mine. So it's bringing a different lens to anthropology. Anthropology sites are changing a lot. I work in Africa. There tended to be this idea of going off to very exotic, so-called primitive societies and understanding that society on its own terms. More and more, there's attention to global business. The Culture Map is a book about breaking through the invisible boundaries of global business. So how do you do global business in Amsterdam, in London, in Bombay or Mumbai or Johannesburg or Nairobi. Um, so anthropology's sites have changed. Laura Nader, the sister of Ralph Nader at Berkeley actually coined the term studying up, studying um, the powerful in society. But we do have kind of a history of studying the disenfranchised and trying through a social justice lens to empower those who don't have a voice for themselves. Number nine, anthropology will change your life. Anthropology is really a heart-driven career. It's a worldview. It's literally almost a cosmological worldview. Once you become trained in anthropology, it's an incredible gift. Sometimes it's even a little bit of a burden because I can't turn my anthropology mind off. If I'm at an office party, I'm still applying emic, emic, cultural relativism, trying to figure out the social networks. So it's an incredible positive tool 
that you can use in every aspect of your life, even as a parent. Margaret Mead, Maria Montessori was actually an anthropologist who studied how children learned. So it's just a very broad and exciting tool set that you can use to understand everything from global business to education of preschoolers. I love it. It's that kind of career. It's maybe not the career that your parents will easily understand. You want to be an anthropologist. What are you going to do with that? The exciting news is that anthropologists get hired by development agencies. They work as small business owners and innovators. They work for the USAID. They work as teachers. It's not just an, an academic career track. There's lots and lots of opportunities. And many of them go to graduate school and get a different set of skills, but they're able to draw on that. For example, one of my close colleagues and friends worked for BlackRock Corporation and was the COO, Chief Operating Officer. And he said that, Chad said that he used his anthropology every single day in this corporate setting in San Francisco to try and understand the relationships in the office and the cross-cultural dimension of his work. So the tool set of anthropology applies to everything, almost anything you want to do in the world. And you can take that tool set. It doesn't mean that you're gonna end up as an archeologist digging in the field for the rest of your life or an anthropologist, cultural anthropologist interviewing people in a faraway place. You can take these skills and apply them to a wide range of current jobs. So you've gotten a taste of anthropology in the first nine important things to know. Number 10, let's end with the importance of anthropology to social justice. Anthropology is really about giving a voice to the disenfranchised, to really listening deeply to people and trying to understand their concerns. Today in the New York Times, there was an article about a Senegalese anthropologist who helped unpack what was happening during Ebola. And this is really important during the pandemic, the worldwide pandemic of COVID-19 as well. What are people's fears? Why are some people not wearing masks? Why during Ebola did people continue to touch bodies in, in a funeral? And understanding that maybe they were afraid or there were what their concerns were, not looking at it from the outside, but from the inside and really listening deeply to people's concerns is the ultimate way to do social justice. We have a history in our discipline. If you think about Nancy Shepard Hughes, who studied favelas in Brazil and tried to understand why women detached themselves from their infants because they knew in some cases that they might not live She's a professor at Berkeley, a very re well-regarded person in the field. Philippe Bourgeois, understanding um, why people are using intravenous drugs, all kinds of social justice topics within the field that are really, really important. So my call to action for anthropology would be that all of the tools that you use through field work, through field notes, through understanding power, social capital, connections, all of those things are really important. And the way to get the call to action for you is engaged anthropology, applied anthropology, not just an ivory tower sitting and discussing these ideas, but actually applying them and making a difference on the ground in real communities. Many, many, many examples of this. I have students in anthropology who now work for refugee resettlement agencies in Denver, in Washington, D.C., in Berlin, and they're able to take that lens of understanding another community and translating that knowledge into policy and action. So hey guys, I love to talk about anthropology and I love more than anything kind of one-on-one -on -one continued discussion. If anything came up, all of it's in my description. You can find my Instagram, my email, my website. But I'd also love to just hear personally from you if you have further questions, discussions. Maybe you want to be an anthropologist and you want to know, how do I major or minor in anthropology? What do I do with an anthropology degree after I graduate? I'm happy to talk about any of those. And everything's in my YouTube description. Thank you so much. Unlike the zebra, anthropology isn't always black and white. 
So I love to talk about the gray areas and really unpack those. So let's keep the conversation going. I really look forward to hearing from you personally.